In this video, I'm going to teach you what you need to know in order to use encoders. First, we'll look at the hardware. The Antimark motors already have encoders built in, so you don't need to worry about setting those up. However, the Tetrix motors do need to have encoders set up on them. This is the hardware you need for putting on encoders onto a Tetrix motor. Note that not all encoders are the same, so your setup might be slightly different. The first thing we'll do is we'll put one of these plates onto the motor. Note that some of the encoders have this clear piece, and some of them come with this blue piece with the spacers. Once that's on, we can start to assemble the encoder. Before you do so, make sure that these three parts all fit together nicely. The next thing we'll do is we'll put on the bottom cap. Make sure that you choose an orientation that you want the port to be facing out of on the encoder before you stick it onto the backplate. Make sure that the holes are concentric with each other. Once you've stuck that on, then we can put on the electronic plate. Now that that's on, we can put on the encoder disc. Before you handle the encoder disc, make sure you put on gloves because the oil on your hands can really ruin these things. Note the orientation of the encoder disc. Make sure that the side with all the lines on it is facing the electronics. You'll be able to push on the encoder disc part of the way, but you won't be able to push it on all the way, so you have to use one of these spacers to push it down the entire way. Once that's been put on, we can put on the top cap. It should just snap to the bottom cap. And now we have assembled an encoder for our Tetrix motor. Go ahead and connect all your wires. Notice the differences between the way the encoder wires connect to the Tetrix motors and how they connect to the Anywark motors. Now that we've set up the hardware, we can take a look at the software. First, open up Android Studio and open up the FTC app that we installed in the previous video. Then in the file tree, navigate to where your code is and make a new op mode. The first thing we'll do, like any other op mode, is to change the comment to the top and change the annotation name. With the registration annotation, you can either choose autonomous or teleop depending on what you're using. I put in the disabled because I don't need to see this op mode whenever I'm choosing an op mode. Now, like all other op modes, we have to declare our hardware. In this instance, we're just declaring the motors because the encoders actually come with the motors. Now that we've declared the motors, we need to initialize them in the main method here. Now that we've initialized our motors, we need to set the modes. I'll describe what each mode does. These are the four modes that we use. Run without encoders allows you to just directly set the motor power without looking at the encoder. However, it will still keep track of the encoder values. Run using encoders allows you to set the speed of the motor. It will look at the encoder values and use a PID loop to make sure it's traveling at the right speed. Run to position allows you to set a target position that the motor will automatically go to and hold its position there. Reset encoders just resets the encoder value to zero. In the initialization, we'll just set the mode to be either run using or without encoders. You can use either, but I recommend you use the encoders. These are the main commands you'll use when you're programming with encoders. Get current position returns the current encoder value. Set target position is used in conjunction with the run to position mode. Give it some position and it will run to the desired position. I explain more about this later on. Is busy will return true if the motors are still running to a certain position when in the run to position mode. Encoders have a certain number of ticks per revolution and they differ for each type of encoder. Tetrix encoders have 1440 ticks per revolution. Andymark encoders have 1120 ticks per revolution. Now, like we did in the basic Atanos video, let's make a few methods to control our motors. Now that we have some methods that control our motors, let's make some methods that actually use the encoders. In the basic Atanos video, we made a method called drive forward time, which drove forward at some power value for some time. It's sort of okay, but it has some inherent flaws with it. The biggest flaw is that it's inconsistent. Let's say you test all of your autonomous code with a fully charged battery, and then you go into competition with an undercharged battery. The motors will be receiving less power, so they won't go as fast. You're driving for the same amount of time, but slower, so you go a shorter distance than you intend, and you miss your target. With encoders, the charge on the battery doesn't matter, because we're directly measuring the distance we've traveled. Now let's make a method that drives forward a certain distance. I recommend using the run to position mode. Here's an example of how we might write the method. The first thing we do is reset the encoder values. When you set the mode to reset encoders, you can't actually set a power for the motors to drive. Because of that, just make sure that you set the mode to something else afterwards. Then we set the target position for the motors to run to. After we set the target position of the motors, we have to set the mode of the motors to run to position. Once the mode has been set, then we have to set the drive power. Once we get to this point, the motors will start driving to the requested position, and we have to wait until they get there. This loop does that for us. The motors have an isBusy method, which returns true if they are still running to a position. In here, we wait until both of the motors have reached their target position. Once we reach the target position, we stop driving and set the mode back to normal. Hopefully all of that makes sense to you. If you have any questions, be sure to post them in the comments below.
You could write similar methods for turning because the encoder values will tell you how far you've turned. Here's an example of how you might do that. One thing to note is that the target position for one of your encoders will have to be negative. This is better than using time for turning, but it still has some flaws with it. Some fields have slightly different surfaces, so you might turn more or less than you intend. It's best to use something like a gyroscope for accurate turning, but we'll cover that in a later video. You can also use the encoders for logical statements. Hopefully all of that teaches you what you need to know in order to use encoders. If you have any questions, be sure to post them in the comments below. Until next time, I will see you guys later. Goodbye.